My name's Rosanna, I'm a Scottish Gypsy Traveller woman and today I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, formative influences between childhood, teen years and early early um, womanhood if you like, when I was a young woman, which has led to um, sort of forming my character today. Um, as I said, I was a Gypsy Traveller, I grew up on Tinker, a Tinker Experiment site, which was the first of the Tinker Experiments set up in 1947. Although obviously, I, hopefully you'll see I'm not that old. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> um, it was, the, the idea behind it was to um, eradicate the scourge of Tinkerdom. <clears throat> so people were forced into it because if they didn't, they used their children to to take them away to put them in care homes or foster them out or industrial schools or whatever um, if they wouldn't desist travelling so they were really rounded up by the um, Secretary of State for Scotland the, um, it was the central government local government, the Church of Scotland was a shaker and mover in it although it says it wasn't and the landlords um, gifted the land on 99 year leases because they thought they were being helpful but I think a lot of people were duped by it um, even the gypsy travellers themselves a lot of them thought they were there because they had served in the war and in actual fact the various files that's to be found on this show that it started in 1895 with a plan to extirpate the community and um, then in 1908 they had the Children's Act, which um, said they had to do 200 days at school to try and um, knock the tinker out of the child. And then during the war, First World War, in order to get the um, the uh, separation allowance, they had to go into a house, the women, or they couldn't get the separation allowance from their husband. But many of them, including my great-grandmother, who was interviewed in Perth at Needless Road, and the minute she um, got out of the, uh, the... heard her husband come out of the trenches, she just packed a bundle and got a tent and came back up the woods. And that's what they did. So they didn't really force them to assimilate. They just did it to get the money. Um, then, after that, the Departmental Committee on Tinkers in Scotland headed up by the Duchess of Athol, Catherine Ramsay, she was the chair, and the Church of Scotland's board member, Dorothy Maitland, was on it, social responsibility for the church. They decided to uh, find out what the makeup of the community was by writing to every parish and taking evidence, and some of the evidence sessions, particularly the one in Perth here, was showing ministers and people who whom you would have thought might have been compassionate to the um, problem, <coughs> what they saw as a problem, <coughs> um, saying we need to get rid of the scourge of tinkerdom, it's a very real social disease, we need to um, uh, knock it out of the children, you need the children from the age of five, you need to make them go through school. So school was definitely the way in which they tried to eradicate the culture and force them to assimilate and force them to give up their nomadic ways. That's how this site came about and it was a prison of war camp um, hut from Ochterarder which had been used latterly as a hospital for the war wounded and it had four sections, it was joined together with four huts with a wall partition and they had a big um, coal fire in the middle um, a little kitchenette with a sink and a little gas cooker <coughs> and a toilet and running water and, and one bedroom and that's what, what it was. But some people were taken from it previously, cousins, because there was overcrowding, but they overcrowded it deliberately. They put big families in that and then came along and said, oh, they're overcrowded, we'll take the twins, before, for instance, before they're born and children were taken into care even before they were born for no other reason without legitimacy between 1948 and 68 under the National Assistance Act and using the SSPCA. <clears throat> it's very difficult to get their files now, they suddenly have all disappeared. And when I grew up in it though, there was all these gypsy travellers living there and they played the pipes, there was no electricity, they sang, they told stories around the campfire, we used to have a fire outside, they would sit outside specifically ghost stories and at night time as it got darker and darker you were frightened to run back to the hut without someone with you because you thought some of these bogeymen were going to jump out and get you. <laughs> you got stories of water kelpies and um, fairies that spat in your eye and called you a dirty tink and all these sort of things, you know, body snatchers and they uh, 
you know, grave robbers and what have you. It was, it was really quite colourful. And everyone played an instrument, whether it be spoons or, you know, the cord in the mouth organ or whatever. They made their own amusement. It wasn't, you didn't have phones, you didn't have computers, didn't have TVs even until I was about, what, 12. We got a battery TV and we used to get the batteries charged in the garage and when there was only enough battery for Top of the Pops or football, the boys and the girls would start punching one another. I'm watching the football, no you're not, we're watching Top of the Pops, you can toddle off. Uh, so, so we had great fun and we used to have more and more relatives come and some of them were wonderful storytellers, you know. They would tell you these stories about, um, you know, sitting in the uh, Kalin and they heard that the Germans were going to march through on this little radio that had a, a glass bit on it and actually it was Berlin and they'd heard Kalin and they got on bikes and cycled all the way from Kalin to Pitlochry thinking they would hide out from the Germans and things like this so you had all these wonderful stories about also when they got the first TV there was these old women and old men and they got the TV battery TV in the shed and they're watching it and one old man, the women are outside listening in, you know, at the door and one old man goes, why don't we turn it upside down and see if their skirts fall over their heads, you know, and the, the old woman opens the door and went, you break, pulls them out and quack, quack, quack with a broomstick, you know, <laughs> so much for PC, <laughs> they would have all been left in pain in the jails today, <laughs> but there were characters that you don't see nowadays, so that was the environment in which we were, and we used to play down the woods, you know, like we got an old cooker one time and we got somebody to hoist it up in a tree, and I got my sister, who was small and thin, and younger than me, to go in the cooker and look out and tell me if someone came I didn't like, and I was sitting there with a cat pill going ping, 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 and um, she, the cooker fell, we all thought she was dead, we were like, oh, she's dead, the cooker's fallen on the ground, and then she come crawling out like Moogly, <laughs> you know, we got up to all sorts, <clears throat> and we used to play a game called Charlie's Angels, because my dad was called Charlie, and I was the only one with uh, sort of ready fair here, so I would sit and go, right, I'm Farrah Fawcett, I'll wait with the sweets, and the other two would punch one another about who was going to be Jacqueline and, and the other girl. And by the time they were finished, the sweets were almost finished. Hence, I'm diabetic today, sweet tooth. <coughs> um, and there was one lady who used to come from the, the houses down below, and she was very posh. And we would stop her and we'd, to play Charlie's Angels. We'd all put our um, school uniforms on because we didn't have any fancy clothes in the summer. And we'd go down and sit there thinking we were smartly dressed. And I had a book and I'd write down. And Alison, a cousin, would jump out and go, right. I'm Alison and I'm here to ask you your business walking through this woods. I need your particulars and I had to write them all down as far as Fawcett. <coughs> and this lady went, oh away with you, you've got no right to be stopping. Yes we have, we're Charlie's Angels. She went, oh no, nonsense, get away with you, there's no such thing. And she went, yes there is, Charlie's my uncle, he lives up in that hut and we're all his angels. <laughs> so that's the sort of games we played. So it was happy in the, you know, in the woods with other travellers and traveller children playing about and you had, it was quite, you, quite a big area to run about and play hide and seek and all sorts of games, hopscotch, double dutch, hula hooping. But then when you went to school and you were five, it was just culture shock <clears throat> because they obviously were being told by the parents not to talk to you, that you were a traveller, gypsy traveller and they would call you Tink and Mink and I remember from day one there was two particular girls who were three years older than me and they used to stamp on my toes, pull my hair, spit on me and then one time I got dragged, the main thing I remember dragged across the playground because I had a new anorak on and they tried to pull my arms out of the sockets and um, there was quite a few round about but what always stuck in my mind is when I looked up I saw the teacher in the class looking out and she was just standing smiling she didn't intervene at all and that always stuck with me and then in the classroom itself because I was hearing only can't from the older ones there was a ten and a half year gap between me and the one oldest to me um, because I was six older and it was all adults coming in speaking can't which has got Sanskrit and Hindi roots basically and um, some people think it's Gaelic or Scots, but having studied Scots language papers at university 
for a year and having studied Gaelic for seven years post school, I can tell you it's not. Um, they would say to you, "There's a pa at school, there's a packet with a picture, and I was still sitting, you know, in primary two, not really making much progress. There's a picture, there's, you know, the word for a woman, a house, a hen, a, a van or whatever, and they uh, put them in the picture. And I just kept going, nee, 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 all the time like this, because I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know the words. I only knew English. I only knew can't. I mean, I didn't know the English. And nobody actually twigged until quite far in, and it was my mother, um, that I wasn't understanding because I was looking for cant words, and these words didn't mean anything to me, however they sounded them out. And I think that had a good, a, a, quite a deep impact on me, because once I realised this thing about different languages, I went on to study Gaelic as a third language, and I did higher French, and I was really, I'm really very keen on languages, and I'm a linguist. Um, and I think that's what had that impact. Um, beyond that, <coughs> after university and that, I've studied teacher training, I was doing fine, and then I left it, I was in a school which I didn't like, and I left it, and then I got, um, I went and retrained in Gaelic television production, but I went back to teaching because there was quite good money in it, and I got a head of department's job. But when I came back down, because the contract didn't start till August, someone else contested it and got the job because they had a permanent contract and it wasn't anything other than just contractual. Um, I came back to the experiment site and I got a flat up the street but I didn't enjoy it at all because some of the people that I used to speak to before I moved up there stopped speaking to me and when I moved back down here they spoke to me again because they didn't want you encroaching on their territory. And I was up and down a lot to my father because he was in the hut and he'd had a stroke and uh, ended up staying in the caravan again. But uh, the, the caravan had no electricity, no running water, no toilet, sewerage, nothing. <coughs> so I had to walk along to the house during the night when he used to go to the toilet to the hut. I tried then to get uh, something done about the lack of electricity and lack of hot water for my dad because he'd been paying rent since the beginning of the experiment and rates then you know poll tax community charge council tax we were getting charged council tax for living in those caravans with no running water or anything when you queried it and said it was water charges now they're still doing it to my brother at the end of the road in 2023 and they can't make any dispensation despite the degrading conditions. And the degrading conditions themselves, I think, had an effect, a profound effect on your mental health because there were days when you thought, you know, this is the 20th century, this is the 21st century and we're still living like this and nobody will help you. I tried all the official bodies, CRE, EHRC, SHRC, every official body, lots of lawyers, you couldn't get anyone to help. And eventually when I'd found the, I went back to the file I had found about Tinker Experiment and I realised it was a national programme and I was campaigning about it. And I never got another day's work after I started campaigning about that and started working for a gypsy traveller organisation called the Scottish Gypsy Traveller Association. The only work I got after that was menial, well not menial but I'd say outdoor or manual work. And I'm not saying I didn't enjoy it but it was very, very heavy. I mean, doing posting all day is quite heavy for a woman to do, and I dispute that if any woman wants to come and stand beside me, because a lot of them couldn't do it. Um, you know, picking acorns, that's quite difficult work, because you're bending all the time, um, trying to get a wee bit up trees to get uh, fir cones, and picking fir cones and things like that, and the cold that's up hills, it's very difficult work. <clears throat> and eventually between that and the leaking caravan with Asperger, the Niger, for which I could get no help either, um, I became quite ill with breathing problems and different things and eventually became a carer to my brother. And um, that's it. I've never had a, 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 a actually any work with a public body since. So I became very interested in human rights. So I thought, what's going on here? And I trained with the MRGI in Strasbourg in 2004. I did a certificate in human rights and I started doing stuff with the Human Rights Commission in 2011, which I still have been doing and eventually ended up on the Lived Experience Leadership Group. 
before that, the Adequate Living Standards Group. And that's really because of my experience of the living standards I've had that made me question it and question it for other people. And why in such a rich economy, really, compared to the developing world or the underdeveloped world, as a small percentage of people left to wither, really, like in conditions like that. Because when you've not got a job and you're not accepted and you're ostracised and you can't have a social life, and then you're told, oh, we wouldn't even fund your projects because we only fund charities, we don't fund anything with a political voice. You've got no outlet at all in the outer world. It's like the world's caved in. And when it's caved in, it becomes your whole life shrinks before your eyes because you lose a lot of contacts and friends because you don't have the money to go and meet them, even for coffee. You don't go to the cinema, you don't go to the theatre, you don't buy clothes, you don't go on holiday. You don't go for coffee, as I say. So that that's what happened to me, really. And I regressed completely in 25 years to the point where I'm worse off than I was when I was a student. So, and that's financially. But um, other than that, there's nothing happening in my life. It's like Meghan Markle says, what you do is you survive, but you don't thrive. She very much put that into words correctly, and I, I, I can empathise with that. And I think also what Prince Harry said, the me you don't see, the me you don't see, and that's the me that's taking all these hits all the time and that you're internalising them and it's what it does to you, what it does to you physically, what it does to you mentally, how you've got to keep pulling yourself up from your bootstraps every day to go back out and face it again. And you know there's never going to be any um, improvement because government doesn't want you to improve, local authorities don't want your situation to improve. Uh, the regulatory bodies won't regulate for human rights or anything, they don't do it. They just say we don't get involved in individual cases. But people don't rush at them en masse because they've all got individual cases and they're isolated and they're not getting together to know what their individual cases are. So that's the situation. So what I did was I ended up doing voluntary advocacy in my community and people would pay my fee or come and pick me up because they wanted me to come. And I would go to um, talk, you know, on planning applications or review bodies, take notes or um, talk to social work for them about their children, talk to schools about their, you know, meet with educationalists, go to core group meetings, um, go down to the council about housing, benefit things, help them with form filling and all that. And that's basically what I've been doing and, and it utilises human rights at the basis of it. Um, because that's that's where the breaches occur occur there and there's always inequalities and i think just lamping everyone with poverty and taking away the cultural experience um doesn't really uh, do justice to people because they've got their cultural hiatus and their cultural traumas which particularly arose out of the tinker experiment because you were having to go to school and be one person with a totally different culture and when you would speak can't you were told don't talk that gobbledygook slap on the back from the teacher and you're going this is my language you know you don't know the difference and then you're going home and you realize you've got to keep that part de uh, compartmentalized as a child in your head away from the other part and it's very difficult to grow up with that without having some sort of cultural trauma and um, you know cultural dislocation and when you came through it and you were quite well educated, go to university, a lot of your own culture turn and look askance at you because this education malarkey is a load of nonsense to them. And they weren't forced into an experiment. So that's what the effects of the experiment were to a certain extent on me, but it'll be worse on some people and there's more. That's a, an overview of it. I think that's why I became very interested in human rights and why um, last year I was invited as a human rights defender to Butte House and to meet with the special rapporteur Mary Lawler uh, at the Human Rights Round Table. <clears throat> but when we got to Butte House, um, the First Minister had only had her photo taken with the foreign human rights defender. She didn't want to meet the two Scottish ones, me and the other lady, Heather. So that's the how much they actually appreciate human rights to my mind it's all right if it's on someone else's backyard that someone's practicing human rights and trying to put them into operation but not in ours and um, I'm not employable now 
not dateable, not marriageable, because people in the town wouldn't mix or marry with you. They didn't invite you to their house. They didn't invite you out. Um, I'm not saying there's not some nice people in this town, because there are. There always is in any culture, anywhere. But it just wasn't a thing that they invited you to their house or they would come to your old hut. And when you were at university, even though I had friends, one of them came and found where I stayed. And when I wrote to her again, she never responded, and neither did the other one that was in the group of three. So basically, um, I think sticking you in an old hut that was ha hanging in bits made you a laughing stock. What I could see is the, the, pe the victims from Tinker Experiment, like myself, became laughing stocks, and you just had to internalise that and get on with it been a very hard life. It's not been really worth living but here we are, we're still here today. Hopefully it'll improve but I don't know. So at the moment we're campaigning for an apology for Tinker Experiment <coughs> um, because some of the other people are not in a position to do it academically or educationally but they've all had the same experience but the government met with us once on the 18th of uh, on the 29th of November 2018 and ignored us ever since and gave all sorts of spurious reasons why they couldn't apologise. They, they basically just said, go away, we don't want to hear about you. Um, your abuse as a part of that experiment, it never happened, but it did and it was very much a genocidal policy because it meets four out of five of the genocide criteria at the UN. And um, yesterday we had a meeting with the Human Rights Commissioner who came here and he's the first Commissioner to actually say I'll come out and meet you and hear this because we've had two previous ones that weren't interested. <coughs> and um, it seemed to go all right. He seems uh, an approachable chap and hopefully something can move forward. Is that okay or do you want more? Or do you want something different? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> don't know if I've given you what you want or not. <laughs> Uh, they're just blathered. 